Hey, welcome to section 10.8. We are looking at the power series. We'll determine whether a power series converges, find the interval of convergence, determine a function using the power series, and use the properties of the power series. This is a big chunk of information, so we are going to split this over two different videos or two different lessons. So we're going to start out with, well, what is a power series? A power series is a series, obviously, um, where we have x raised to some power, some exponent. So we can use that k or the n, depending on what we are referencing. Basically, you have power. That's what we're looking for. So if x is a variable, then a series of the form a sub k, x to the k, um, a sub k is any constant in the front, has that following form that is considered a power series in x or in terms of x. It's a power series centered at zero. As opposed to the second form that's down below, this one, where I have x minus c to the k, this power series would be centered at something like zero, or not zero, excuse me, any value of c. Um, what do I mean by that? This was a conversation that came up in class. So for example, if I have y equals x squared, then if I had y equals x minus 2 quantity squared, remember the original is a parabola that opens up. It passes through the origin. That minus 2 squared shifts it two units to the right. So the same thing happens here. That minus c is the shifted to the right. There was a conversation yesterday. Okay, well, what does it mean to be centered? So what we're going to do, and I think this is easier to talk about where we're going so you can understand why that is. We're going to have a function and we're going to replace it with a long polynomial or some series. It's actually what we're doing in 10.9 and 10.10. So when I say, where is it centered? Where do those match up? So give me a quick second. I'm going to switch screens and I'll show you. Okay, so on my screen, I have the Jesmos website pulled up, I Googled, you know, graph series and polynomials for me. And this is what they gave me. This example will make a little bit more sense in a couple lessons, but what we're doing is we're going to look at the cosine curve. So here in green, this is the cosine curve. It's the same one you've had your whole life. It goes up to a positive one. It goes as low as a negative one. One wavelength is two pi, plain old cosine. What's going to happen is I will eventually show you how to write cosine as the sum of different terms. And I know that sounds really weird, but there's a formula, it'll work. I promise it'll be okay. So that whole list of polynomials will be able to write as a sum with this summation series. So here's my summation and that will replicate cosine. So now I'm gonna graph the sum, just take my word for this. I promise this will work. But when I say it's centered at zero, right now my connection is centered here in the middle of the graph at zero, just above the origin. So where x equals zero and y equals one. That's where the red line, which is my estimate or my new curve, matches up with the green curve, which is cosine. Now, does the red line make a good approximation or a good replacement of that cosine curve? No, it's terrible. There's no curvature in it at all. And that's because if I look at number three here, that means my k is equal to one. Or actually, k is equal to zero, even better. So all I have is a horizontal line of y equals one. If I make k equal to one, this is my power series. It's x raised to a power. All that other stuff is just stuff, but it's x raised to a power. So it's a power series. If I put one in place of n, that means I have an x squared. And if I look at the red curve now, it is indeed a parabola. It's opening down, but it's x squared if it opens down. So the parabola, while well, it matches pretty close here around zero, it doesn't match the further way we get from zero. So let me do two terms, two k's rather, I keep saying terms. So if k equals two, now I have something to the fourth power. So this red curve, this red w, yeah, now it's starting to match. It's starting to match up with that cosine curve a little further out. And in fact, the more terms I have, the further out from where it's centered do those two graphs match. So we're centered at zero. And I just want to zoom out here and, and give you an idea of where we're going. So this goes 
actually, if I play this, I'll hit play. It's a little crazy. But the more K values I'm getting, the more terms I have in that partial sum, the longer and longer and longer, or the further out from X equals zero, they start to match. Now, what do we talk about in this class? Do we talk about 40 terms? No, we talk about an infinite number of terms. Um, and I did try this in one class. I tried to put in infinity and I didn't like it. There are computational limitations on software. So it, it couldn't figure out infinity. But if I put in 100 and I go all the way up to here to 100, everything that's between negative and 40 and 40 matches. I zoom out a little bit. I don't know if I can see that red curve anymore. We can't. <laughs> that one's really close. But obviously the more terms you have, the better a match it will be. So let's do something like that. Now, what do you suppose happens with an infinite number of terms? Well, for cosine, this will turn into a match that's exact. So we will talk about that at a later date. So if I say it's centered at zero, this is what it looks like. All right, so let's talk about that shift a little bit. Um, I have taken our cosine curve that we had and I put in a plus pi. So what that's done is it's moved the maximum here that usually happens on the y-axis and it's moved it to the left pi. So this is over here at negative 3.14. Um, in fact, I can graph that for you. X equals negative pi. All right, so that red line used to be the y-axis. So it's taken that cosine curve and it has shifted it to the left pi. I hope you can see that. Now, if I take my um, series here, it's still red, let's make it, I'll keep that red, we'll make this dotted and not If I look at my series and zero terms is not so helpful, but k equals three. So now it's centered, right? But now we're centered at negative pi. So where that series matches my original graph, where's that starting point? That starting point is now a negative pi. So these are some concrete examples of where we are going. But when I say we're centered at zero or centered at something else, this is the visual that I want you to think of each time. Okay, so now that we've looked at a few examples of work, an example being centered at zero and one example being centered at something other than zero, let's see if we can dive into these power series. Now, we want to find all numbers X for which each power series converges. Um, I made a little bit of a mistake. I didn't leave a whole lot of space for myself. So I'll do part A, I'll erase it, I'll come back and do part B. You're just going to want to either grab another piece of paper or write relatively small. We have most power series, I don't wanna say all, but most of the time or a lot of the time we can actually use the ratio test to figure out where it converges. So we're gonna use that a little bit differently each time or we'll use it the same way, but we'll have different results. So for part A, and I know we talked about the ratio test in two lessons ago. If I have the series that's listed in A, I set this up with the limit as n approaches infinity, remember the numerator gets an n plus one any place there's a k. So this is x to the n plus one over n plus one factorial all over x to the n over n factorial. So what do we do with this ratio test from here? Well, we talked about multiplying by the reciprocal instead. So this now becomes the limit as n approaches infinity I have x to the n plus 1 over x to the n times n factorial over n plus 1 factorial. So all I did was I just lined up the x's vertically and lined up the n's vertically. We did that a little bit with the ratio test. It just makes it a little, a little nicer to look at visually. So what happens next? What simplifies? Well, if you recall, x to the n plus 1 over x to the n is just like having four to the third power over four to the second power, you wind up subtracting those exponents. So we're left with four to the first power. So that works with X and N as well. This is now the limit. As N approaches infinity, 
This becomes x in the numerator. Um, the factorials, we talked about simplifying last time as well. This is like having 4 factorial over 5 factorial. And this would be the same as 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Without space. This is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So everything except that first piece cancels out in the numerator. So this is n plus 1. Still inside the absolute value. Now, it's a limit problem. We still have to go through and evaluate this limit situation. We're looking at n approaching infinity. So be very careful. We've done x values in limits for most of the problems to this point. Now we're talking about n is the one that's getting the value of infinity. So this will become the limit as n approaches infinity. Absolute value of x. I'm just rewriting it. You can turn these into like multiplication. So the absolute value of x times the limit as n approaches infinity of one over n plus one. Technically, you can write it like that. The whole point is, or the whole end result is the second piece will become zero because it's one over infinity. We know that one over infinity is zero. So we have absolute value of x times zero. Well, what's anything times zero? It's zero. Now, if you recall the ratio test, we came up with this value L at the end. And if L was less than one, then the series converged. And that's the idea that we're going to use here. If L is less than one, then the series converges. Now, a lot of times we'll have an X left, but in this case, we don't. So is zero less than one? Yes. And because zero is always less than one, the ratio test will always, not the ratio test, the series always converges. Or it converges everywhere. Um, the question is find all numbers X for which each power series in X converges. Okay, so if it converges everywhere, we could say negative infinity is less than X, which is less than infinity. So part A converges everywhere. Part B, we're going to do this again. I'm going to clean the screen off. We're going to do the ratio test again, and we'll see what happens with this one. Okay, part B. So we still have this power series. We're going to use the ratio test. This will be the limit as n approaches infinity. So again, anything that's a k becomes an n plus 1. So I have n plus 1 x to the n plus 1 over 4 to the n plus 1 all over n x to the n over 4 to the n. These are kind of annoying to set up. Once you have this fraction divided by a fraction, this complex fraction or whatever we're calling it, you'll multiply by the reciprocal. And again, I'm going to line up the n's and the x's. It just makes a little bit more sense to my brain. Um, if you don't need to do that, awesome. You have younger, younger brains than mine. All right, so I have the n's lined up together, I have the x's lined up together, and then I have the four's lined up together. So the n plus one over n, just hang tight to that. Nothing happens there right away. There's nothing to simplify at the moment. The x to the n plus one over x to the n, this will turn into an x in the numerator. The 4 to the n over the 4 to the n plus 1, this becomes 1 over 4. There's a 4 in the denominator. Now, we can break this into two pieces. I'm not going to rewrite it for space, but you can have the limit of the first piece, and then you can have the limit of the second piece. It's important because we're finding, again, the limit as n approaches infinity. We have nothing to do with x. We pretend x is a constant right now because we're only dealing with n. We can only deal with one variable at a time. So if n approaches infinity, n plus 1 over n, this is infinity over infinity. It's indeterminate. How do we handle that? We actually have two choices. Most of you are going to tell me use L'Hopital. You technically can divide everything by n. But whatever you decide to do, you wind up with a 1. So the first piece is a 1. Now, the rest of this still exists. But that n, because there's no n present, the infinity has no bearing on the situation. So I have x over 4. So you wind up with this expression. We now have an x that's inside of the absolute value. So what we need to do is say the absolute value of x over 4 is less than 1. 
where did the one come from? That's where the ratio test converges. Anytime that ratio, that answer of L is less than one, that ratio test shows convergence. We want to know where it converges, so we set it less than one. There's a lot going on here. Now, the four, four is positive all the time. It doesn't really need to be inside the absolute value. So I'm going to multiply both sides by four. So the absolute value of X is less than four. Cool. Back in algebra two, maybe a little bit in algebra one, but definitely algebra two, you discussed absolute value and inequalities. And how did you solve these? You had to write them twice. Once was the original, and the other was the negative on the right-hand side, and you flip the sign. You gotta flip the sign. So if I put all of this together, I have, I apologize for zigzagging over my paper here. I've got negative four is less than X, which is less than four. That's where the series is good for. That's where it converges. That's where it matches the original. Now, one other thing. I want you to remember interval notation. If you go to check your answers with the textbook resources, they use interval notation. So they'll call this negative four to four. Personally, I like the inequality. It gives me a better, quick, quick visual as to what's going on. I don't have to stop and think, oh, is that an ordered pair or is it interval notation? But the choice is yours. So that is part B. This is from negative four to four. So instead of being convergent everywhere, this converges over an interval from negative four to four. All right, let me erase and we'll come back and do part C. Okay, part C, power series. Again, we have the X to the K or the X to the N. That shows the power, it shows the exponent. So this is the power series. So we use the ratio test, the limit as N approaches infinity. I have N plus one factorial, X to the N plus one, all over N factorial X to the N. This one's easy because it's set up for me already. So what does this simplify to? This becomes the limit as N approaches infinity of N plus one. And what happens with the X's, this simplifies to an X in the numerator. Now, remember, N is what has infinity in this case, not the X. So infinity plus one, this is infinity. I'm timesing it by the absolute value of X. Infinity times X, this is going to be infinity. So then you have to ask yourself, okay, is infinity less than one or where is infinity less than one? And the answer is it's not, there's no solution. So this one doesn't converge anywhere. We actually say this one diverges. Um, and if you want to read a little bit more on those, it's exactly example one in your book in section 8.4. All right, great. Now, what's next? Convergence or divergence of a power series. If the power series converges for a number that's not zero, then it converges absolutely for all numbers for which the absolute value of X is less than or equal to X sub zero, that initial X. If the power series diverges for a number, then it diverges for all numbers for which the absolute value of X is greater than X. I don't have a really good explanation for this. So for example, two, I feel like this is a little bit backwards. It'll make a little sense once we talk about a radius of convergence. But if you can remember that picture that I showed you earlier in the video where we had cosine and we had the red curve that matched up for a little bit, you want it wherever you're centered, it converges symmetrically in both directions. So the absolute value, so it converges symmetrically to the right, converges symmetrically to the left. So that has to match. So I think of these as number lines. I'm sure that's not mathematically the best way to think about it, but that's what I do. I think of them as number lines. So for letter A, if the power series converges for X equals two, six, then it converges absolutely for X equals three. To show that it's true, if you look at your textbook, they just talk about it. They don't really do any math, just show. Now, these are centered at zero because I have an X by itself. It's not X minus something. So I know it's centered at zero. So I'm thinking of a number line, here's zero. Over here is X equals six. So I know that this converges between zero and six. So if it converges to the right between zero and six, it also has to converge to the left to negative six. And that doesn't mean anything to us in example A, but it will 
and the second one in part B. So the question is, well, what's going on at three? So three is right here. So I know it's centered at zero. This is where we're centered. I know that it converges over here at six. So because three is between zero and six, it has to converge at three as well. It has to converge at three. Don't get hung up on the word absolutely for this case. Absolute means absolute value, left and right. Um, so we're good. So it converges absolutely because, yeah, both versions of it converge, whether it's positive or negative. For part B, think of a number line again. This still is centered at zero. That's where we're starting. It diverges for four. So over here is four. Now, diverge means that they don't match up. I'm going to represent that with an open circle. Over here is negative four. So all of this is divergent to the right of four, to the left of negative four. Um, the endpoints are a little bit tricky. We'll get to those next. But I know that it diverges on the other side of four, negative four. It could converge anywhere in here. Maybe it converges, maybe it doesn't. We don't know. They didn't give us enough information. We only know that it diverges at four. So they're bringing in, or they're starting to discuss a negative five. Well, negative five is over here. So because negative five is further away from zero than that four was, absolute value, distance, we're going in both directions, because that negative five is further away than the four was, it has to diverge. It has to diverge. If four diverges, then anything further than that four must also diverge. All right, and that's it. I know I give you a lot of space on that one, but you don't need a whole lot of space. Theorem for a power series, exactly one of the following is true. It can either converge only at one value of X, it converge for all values of X, or it converge to a positive number R. And that capital R is used for radius, that radius of convergence that we are just talking about. So example three, find the radius of convergence and the interval of convergence of the power series. It gets a little messy to write. We're going to start with the ratio test. So we're going to do the limit as n approaches infinity of x to the 2n plus 1 over n plus 1 over the original x to the 2n over n. Instead of dividing by that fraction, we know we're going to multiply by the reciprocal. I'm going to distribute that to exponent of the C pattern. <laughs> if I simplify the x's, if the limit as n approaches infinity, this first piece is going to simplify to x squared. It's x to the 2n that cancels out. And I have n over n plus 1. Again, n is the piece that has infinity. I know that this is infinity over infinity. It's indeterminate. We're going to find L'Hopital or figure out that this is 1. But when we're all done, we get absolute value of x squared um, times 1. And then we have to set this less than 1 because we want to know where does it converge. So we have x squared less than one. What we need to do is solve for x. We need to isolate the x. Because we have a positive one already, we can take the square root on both sides. So the absolute value of x is less than one. Your radius of convergence is what you get when you isolate that x, when you get it all by itself. So radius of convergence is equal to one. Sometimes you just see r equals one. And then we have a second piece to that, and that's the interval of convergence. And the interval of convergence is what happens when you're looking at that number line. You're thinking of a number line. So again, it might be curvy, like that cosine value, right? If you go up and down and up and down. But just to simplify the process, you're thinking of the number line. How far out from that center do we converge? So absolute value, inequality, I know that my 
interval of convergence is going to go from negative one to one. So negative one is less than x, which is less than one. It would look something like this in interval notation. All right. Now, there is an additional step to this. Up here on the top, it says the behavior of the series at R, this minus C is just showing the shift. The behavior of the series at R must be determined separately. So that's not a lot of words for a big idea. The idea is you have to test the endpoints. So my two endpoints are one and negative one. What do I do with those? Well, you're going to test them in the original series. So x equals one. We're going to put one in place of the x. So I have the series from one to infinity. This is one to the two k over k. All right, well, one to the two k, no matter what I do, that's always going to be a one. So this is really the same thing as k equals one to infinity of one over k. This should be familiar to us. We've talked about one over k or one over n over and over and over again. So the question is, does that converge or does that diverge? It diverges. It's the harmonic series. We've used the integral test. We can talk about the p-test, but we know that this diverges. So you don't only try one, but you also try negative one. Let me move this work over here. So x equals negative one. I'm going to say, here's my series, k equals one to infinity, negative one to the two k all over k. Well, it's negative one squared to the k power, and negative one squared will always be positive one to the k over k. One to the k is always going to be one. This is also one over k. This also diverges, harmonic and what have you. So because it diverges on those two endpoints, the one and the negative one, we don't get to include those. So if you're thinking of a picture, all right, we're centered at zero, over here is negative one, over here is one. I think of those algebra two pictures. It converges anywhere between one and negative one, but it doesn't converge outside of that. Isn't that kind of crazy? All right. Let's try one more, and this is example four. This one will have a little bit, um, a little bit more to show you. And the radius of convergence R and the interval of convergence of the power series. Now, in class, I wasn't paying attention, and I jumped right into the ratio test. I didn't need to do that. If I look, this is to the k power. This is also to the k power in the denominator. So we can rewrite this. So this is x over k plus two quantity squared. This whole thing is to the k. The numerator's to the k, the denominator's to the k. So I'm just gonna pull the k to the outside. So if I have this whole thing to the k power, what kind of test can I use? And we can use the root test here. You'll find that the ratio and the root test often go hand in hand. That's a question I've been getting a lot. How do I know which test to use? It takes practice. Look through those flow charts. Look through the flow charts. Look for clues. Practice, practice, practice. So this would be one where we can use the root test. So I can take the k root of this. So this is the limit as n approaches infinity. I guess it should be the n root, the n root of x, k plus two quantity squared, n plus two, excuse me. This whole thing to the n power, we know the root and the power cancel out. So this is the limit as n approaches infinity of x over n plus two quantity squared. It's a limit problem. So what do we do? We put infinity in place of the n. I now have x over infinity. This is going to be equal to zero. So now you want to ask yourself, okay, if we did the root test, what does it mean if I get a zero? So you're going to go back to your chart if you're still a little shaky on them and you're going to see what it's equal to. The root test is similar to the ratio test in that if it's less than one, it converges. So zero is definitely less than one. So this one converges, there's no X left. This converges everywhere. 
So if it converges everywhere, what's your radius of convergence? Your radius of convergence would be infinity because it goes on forever and ever and ever. Your interval of convergence, you can tell me negative infinity is less than x, which is less than infinity. All right. Now let's try one more. I think I've got time for one more in here. Find the radius of convergence r and the interval of convergence for the power series. This is the one where I think you can actually see a little bit of what happens. Let's go. Too many choices. Um, ratio test. The top is there. The bottom is not also to the k power. So this will be a ratio test. So it's the limit as n approaches infinity. Now negative one to the n plus one. Maybe you know what happens here already. Maybe not. Let me remind you in just a moment. Now, those big lines that I just put in, those big vertical lines are absolute value. Absolute value means always positive. If I look at negative one to the n plus one and negative one to the n, those are what indicates that it's alternating. It's going plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. Doesn't matter if it's positive or negative because we're dealing with absolute value. So you can ignore those alternating pieces. So this is the limit. As n approaches infinity, I'm going to have x minus 2 to the n plus 1 over x minus 2 to the n times n plus 1 over n plus 2. Okay. What does this simplify to? We have the limit as n approaches infinity. The beginning is an x minus 2, um, n plus 1, n plus 2. Remember what happens when we put infinity in place of n. We get infinity over infinity. That's indeterminate. We can use L'Hopital. We get 1 over 1. That all becomes a 1. I'm left with the absolute value of x minus 2. We're using the ratio test that converges anytime that value, that L value at the end is less than 1. So I say the absolute value of 2. The absolute value of x minus 2 less than 1. And then I think back to algebra 2. All right, alge 2, what do we do with those absolute value inequalities? You write it twice. We have x minus 2 is less than 1. We have x minus 2 is greater than negative 1. So if I solve each of these for x, I have x is less than 3. I have x is greater than negative 1. Put them all in order. Negative 1 is less than x, which is less than 3. So this is almost my interval of convergence, negative 1 to 3. The truth is we don't know what's happening at negative one and we don't know what's happening at three. We don't know what's happening for those endpoints. You can find the values closer to zero, closer to two, excuse me, closer to two and further away from two, but you don't know what's exactly going on at those endpoints. So you are going to test those endpoints into the original problem. More and more work. This is, let me switch colors. K equals zero to infinity, negative one to the K. Remember, we're talking about X values. So X gets replaced with a negative one. So this is negative one minus two to the K all over K plus one. Um, what do I got going on here? Hold please. I don't have time to edit this out, but you probably found it already. I have a math error. This is x is greater than positive one. That's what happens when you do things in a rush. So this should be a positive one is less than x, which is less than three. So if I put in a positive one here, now we're good. Um, I've got k equals zero to infinity. This is negative one to the k. This will also be negative one to the k over k plus one. Negative one to the K, negative one to the K. You can group those together because they're with the same exponent and this becomes a positive one. So this is really one over A plus one. We're still going from zero to infinity. So with that plus one in the denominator, we talked about this with the integral test, but this is really just a version of our harmonic series. This is going to diverge. So because of that, one is not included. So we don't change our answer at all. We don't do anything now.
And then we have the next piece, three. We want to try three. So we're going to have the series from zero to infinity, negative one to the k, three minus one to the k, all over k plus one. Nope, not three minus one, three minus two. So three minus two is one. So I've got negative one to the k is really a one over k plus one. Looks almost like the last problem, except the numerator in the second piece is a one. So this one over k plus one, that piece is still harmonic, even though it has the plus one in the bottom, that still diverges. However, the negative one to the k in the front makes it alternating. And so this one will converge by the alternating series test. They have to be decreasing terms and they have to tend towards zero, which this does do. So this one converges because it's alternating. It's conditionally convergent, but that's okay, it converges. So what that means is it now converges at three, all that work, and I get to underline. So it's less than or equal to. I know it's a little bit of a letdown. I agree with you completely. So your final answer for the interval of convergence is one is less than X, which is less than or equal to positive three. That's all for notes for today. I would recommend, and I don't know exactly which problems they are, but I would start with the problems that say, find the radius of convergence and find the interval of convergence. Don't wait till we finish this lesson in the next class. So good luck, make sure you finish up any of the old assignments as well.